So, you know, last week we started a new series called Breath, and uh, I, some of the little bit of feedback that I got back was that it was deep. <laughs> but here's the thing of it is, is, is when I look at my job description, I, I kind of take it out of Ephesians. It's Ephesians chapter 4, um, and we're going to look at uh, verse 11. And it says, And He, speaking of Jesus, He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ. That would be, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and the cunning craftiness, and deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things unto Him who is the head, Christ. I might as well finish it out. For, for, from whom the whole body is joint and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does to share, causes growth, of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So when I think of what my job description is, it's to edify you, edify the body, to grow up into Christ and mature so that we as the body can do the ministry, the work that of the kingdom of God in, in the world. And I, I would strongly recommend that, you know, some of you might move, some of you might go other places, but whenever you're looking for a church, you should sit there and say, am I maturing? Am I growing? Am I being stretched? Am I being pulled to, to reach forward to who I am supposed to be in Christ Jesus? Am I growing up into Him? You know, it's easy to give, you know, five points, give you a list to do every week, pat you on the back, and, and send you out the door. But the thing of it is, is I do not find that in Scripture. Scripture isn't about us doing. It's about us being. See, too often religion tells us to do, do, do. Do this, and then you'll be. I'm trying to explain to you who you are and, and trying to mature you into who you are in Christ Jesus. And by believing... You walk that out in faith. You do. You understand that? That's, there's, a, there's a big difference there. So, so, I just say all that so you know when we jump into series like we are in this, um, I, there is a little bit of me in this because I enjoy this. So, you kind of get what I enjoy. Um, but I don't think this is too much for you guys to handle, right? And last week, you know, we've seen that in Scripture, that Scripture tells us that all of humanity depends on the breath of God to sustain their lives, right? We read in Job where he says that if God was to just suck his breath back in, we would just all turn to dust. Right? All human beings depend on the breath of God to sustain their lives. And that breath originated from the first breath of God that was released into Adam. That was released into Adam. And that's, that's just an amazing picture. That God imparted something of Him into, into Adam. And through Adam, through Adam, God fathered all of humanity. All of humanity. That, that one breath that He breathed into Adam was passed down to everyone. And all of humanity is sustained by that one breath. What a powerful breath. Talk about CPR, right? He, he breathed us all into existence. And, and, and through Adam, God fathered all of us, and that's including you. 
And this is true of every single person that ever walked the earth except one. This is true of everyone except one. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In case you don't know what the, who, who this is talking about, this is talking about Jesus. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus is the only one that did not come into physical existence because He's eternal, right? It was only His physical body that came into existence. He's God, right? So, don't misunderstand that. It, Jesus didn't... When he, he became a man, was it when He came into eternity? He was from eternity. Right? You understand that? But He was the one man that walked the earth that did not descend from Adam. In John chapter 6, verse 46, it says, Not that anyone has seen the Father except the One who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. They died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life for the life of the world is my flesh. The life of the world is Jesus. Jesus gave His life so that we might live. In John chapter 8, verse 23, it says, And He was saying to them, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Think about that. Think about sitting there, being, being one of the disciples, sitting there, listening to Jesus say this, and you're thinking, man, this guy's, it'd be hard to believe, wouldn't it? The space invaders or something. But, but Jesus is trying to explain something to us is that He's not like us. He's he, he, he has different origins than us. Right? In, this, in John chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love Me. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on My own initiative, but He sent Me. Jesus these are, these are what, this is what Jesus said about Himself. I find it funny that people, you hear people make comments that Jesus never claimed to be God. What in the world? We, what did we just read? See, through Adam, God fathered all of humanity and the only exception was the birth of Jesus. Jesus was physically born of Holy Spirit. Jesus was physically born by Holy Spirit. He descended directly from heaven as the Word became flesh and Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. And what's so awesome about this is do you know that statement, the only begotten Son of God is only found in the Gospel. When you get into the book of Acts, in the New Testament, the epistles, they no longer call Jesus the only begotten Son of God. They switch and they start calling Him the first begotten Son of God. And we're going to see today, we're going to see 
how, how that all came to be. So Jesus, He stands in contrast to the rest of humanity. The rest of humanity was born of Adam, and He stands in contrast to all of that. So it's important that you understand who you are. Right? Most people don't know why they're here. They don't know who they are. And they're just bouncing around through life. Right? A couple of weeks ago, I, I, I asked you guys that question. Why, why did God even make us? Right? And we answered that question because He desired sons and daughters. God desired offspring. He desired sons and daughters. So we need to know who we are. Who did our Father create us to be? And we talked about how we are seen in Scripture as a spirit, soul, and body. Right? And then we talked about how some places it show that we are a spirit, soul, and body, and then other places it seems like we're... It only talks about spirit and body or soul and body. And it, it can kind of get kind of confusing. What, what is it? And there's some teachers that teach the, the, the triunity, the, the trichotomy of humanity. Other people teach dichotomy, which is three and two, right? That is how we're, we're made up. And the truth of the matter is, is God wants you to see yourself as mono. Dichotomy. One. And I'm getting way ahead of myself. But this is where the Lord's leading me, so I'm going to keep talking. I want you to think about something. Jesus is God. Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. They are not separate. And one of the things that either knowingly or unknowingly that the church does, it separates them. It makes a, they, they even make a hierarchy within the Trinity. There is no hierarchy. They are one. Jesus says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen Me. I do nothing apart from the Father. I say nothing apart what, from what He says. I do nothing apart from what He does. When the Holy Spirit is moving, when the Holy Spirit is, is working, He's not doing that independent from the Father or independent from the Son. It's they're one working together. And we divide them. And we're never supposed to divide them. And we've done the same thing with us. We've divided ourselves. We say our spirit is good, but our, our body, our physical body is evil. Do we? We, we? we say that our, our mind, that God saved my spirit, but my soul is, is, is he, he's, it's corrupt, it's, it needs to be changed, it, all, of these, all, of these, all of these things. And God wants us to start seeing ourselves as one. That, that He is sanctifying, He is building us up in Christ Jesus Spirit, soul, and body. If you believe that, you, that your biggest problem is you, your biggest problem isn't you. You know what your biggest problem is? It's sin trying to get in you. It's us not understanding who we are and allowing the deception of this world, this fallen world, to deceive us in acting contrary to who we are in Christ Jesus. So, back to where we were. You have a soul, you have a spirit, but what does it look like? Have you ever thought about this? What does it look like? Because you have to keep in mind that every Christian and every non-Christian has a soul and a spirit. Here's the thing you have to understand. And we're going to see this in Scripture. Your soul has a definite shape and size. 
it has it is structured much like your physical body. And scripture likens the nature of the soul with the nature of blood in the human body. Look at these following scriptures that associate the soul with blood. In Genesis 9 4, only you shall not eat the flesh with its life. That word life is the word soul. That is its blood. In Leviticus, 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 Leviticus 17 14, it says, For as for the soul, the life of all flesh, its blood is identified with the, its life, its soul. Therefore, I said to the sons of Israel, You shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life, the soul of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. In Leviticus 17 11, for the life, the soul of all flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life, the soul, that makes atonement. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 23, only be sure not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, the soul, and you shall not eat the life, the soul, with the flesh. Now we understand that the Old Testament is shadows and types, right? And he's in the Old Testament they're trying to teach something. And as you can see from these scriptures, the soul with the blood is it's 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 showing us imagery between those two. Just as the blood saturates your entire being and saturates your entire entire physical body, we can understand that your soul does the exact same thing. Your soul is overlaid onto your physical body. The soul is not existing physically in the blood because it's invisible. It's a spiritual entity, right? It's spiritual, it's not physical, right? It's, it's, it's a spirit that's, but it's corresponding to the blood. The way that the blood is the life of the physical body, so the soul is, is the life of our, our, of our spiritual self. You understand that? Did I say that right? The blood? Yep. So, so think of it this way. Just as your blood, uh, your blood fills your body, your soul fills your body. It's the shape of your physical body. It has structure. It has shape. And we see this in Scripture. In the Old Testament, do you remember King Saul? He wanted to talk to the prophet Samuel. The only problem was is the prophet Samuel had died. Right? So he went to a medium, which this is, you don't do this. This is evil. Right? He goes to a medium to conjure up the prophet Samuel. And Samuel shows up and he's not happy one bit. He asks Saul, why are you bothering me? But what, the whole point of this is, is to see that when he did show, show up, he had shape. And his shape was just like his physical body. It had, it had structure. It, it, he, he, it says that he appeared in the form of an old man. And that King Saul recognized him. Right? And just for, for another one, Jesus gave us a parable. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus told us the story of the rich man, Lazarus and the rich man. Right? And he refers to Lazarus' finger. And he refers to a rich man's tongue. See, That's what you look like in the spirit. You have a finger, you have a tongue. I believe that Jesus was not misleading us. I believe Jesus was telling us the truth. Even though they were separated from their physical bodies, they were you could still see them, you could tell who they were, and they had 
the state in, in, in the spiritual in the spiritual realm, they had the same characteristics as their physical body. Right? I think that's pretty cool. So if you were able to see your soul with your physical eyes, it would appear as your body. It would have arms, it would have legs, it would have facial features. That's who you are. Your soul is shaped similar to your body. The soul is superimposed over. It's filling the same location as your physical body. It's in you. So how about, your, how about the spirit of a person? How about the spirit of a person? If we're again, we don't want we're not, we don't want to live separate. We want to live as one, right? We want to live as one. We just like God the Father, God the Son, and God Holy Spirit are one. You will experience more and more victory in your life when your spirit, soul, and body are one. Are one. So, for, but for teaching's sake, if you were to separate the spirit from the soul, your, the spirit, it wouldn't have shape or size as we understand shape and size. Remember, the spirit fills and gives life to the soul and the body. Right? Your spirit comes into the soul and it fills the soul. It fills the body. But the Spirit is the God stuff. It's the God stuff. And, and it's the God stuff that's in all of us. And Scripture makes many cons- comparisons of the Spirit, and it compares it to light. It compares it to life. It compares it to energy. Because the soul... What the Spirit does to the soul, it brings life, it brings light, it brings energy, it brings the substance, the life of God into your soul and causes you to be a living being. Right? If God was to take back His Spirit, take back His breath, we would all turn to dust. Right? That's the life of God within us. But understand, these are just comparisons to help our understanding. Your, your spirit is not light as we know light. It is not energy as we know energy. It's not, it's not even life the way that we know life. It's, it's of God. right? And, and we're just trying to understand. We're trying to take things that the Scriptures use and, and get an idea of what it is. But we, we can't limit our understanding just to natural comparisons. Right? It, it's of God. So, in Proverbs 4.23, it says, watch over your heart with all diligence. And we're going to get, in, in this teaching, in this series, we're going to get into understanding what is your heart. How many have you ever been confused? What is my heart? What is, what is the, my, my heart? And, and we're going we're gonna to get into this, but I want to, ch- we're not going to get in today. <laughs> It says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow springs of life. See, Scripture talks about the Spirit as not some stagnant structure. It's moving, it's flowing. We see that in in Genesis where it says that it was brooding over the waters. It's, it's, It's constantly moving. It's more accurate to think it as, as, and again, these are just human terms trying to understand God things. It's like moving energy that's, that's flowing from a person's innermost being. It's, it's from the heart flow the issues, the springs, the springs of life. And listen to this. And this is where we're going to be going. I'm just giving you a teaser here. That spirit, 
getting ahead of myself. Spirit of Christ is in you. Listen, listen to in Mark chapter 5, verse 30. It says, Immediately, Jesus perceiving in himself that power proceeding from him had gone forth. You remember this story? The woman of the issue of blood? She just thought to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. And there was a crowd all around Jesus. And she came up and pushed her way through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment. And he says, who touched me? He said, who touched me? And the disciples like, who touched you? We're being mauled. There's people all around us. He said, he says, Power proceeding from him had gone forth. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garment? See, there was the life of the Spirit of Christ that was in Christ. And someone reached out and touched him. And it flowed. That spring of life flowed out of Jesus and healed that woman. And healed that woman. In Romans chapter 1, verse 11, this is the, the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Think about that. Most people would say that's heresy to say that you can impart spiritual gifts to people. But the Apostle Paul is saying that he longed to come to the Romans to establish them so that he can impart spiritual gifts. What does that look like? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. He says, For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Through the laying on of my hands. See, there is the spring of life that was in Paul that he received from Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself. And he was able to lay hands on people and impart spiritual gifts. Jesus told his disciples, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There, there's the... There's the Throughout church history, there has been the doctrine of laying on of hands. We pray for one another. We lay hands on the sick. And to understand, the reason we can do that is because we have springs of living water. Jesus says that they become rivers of living water. This is who we were born to be. So what's the difference between if, if, if a non-Christian has a soul and spirit and a Christian has the same soul and spirit, is there any difference between us? Is there any difference between us? See, Jesus explained that He who believes in Him would have rivers of living water flowing from their innermost being. Do you believe in Jesus this morning? Do you know that in you, He longs to have rivers of living water? He's, he's, he's describing the Spirit in some kind of natural terms. He... To have the Spirit flowing from you, rivers of living, living water from your innermost being. Both Christians and non-Christians have a Spirit that sustains their lives and flows within them, but the rivers within the believer consist of living waters. And we're going to see why here in just a little bit. Jesus also said that those who came to Him would have a well of water springing up into eternal life. Eternal life isn't a period of time. It's not something in the future. 
It's in you. It's in you. Internal life is in you. It is this life that we must identify as the quality that is unique to the spirit of a Christian. A spirit of a Christian has eternal life in it. And it's a free gift. When God created Adam, He gave Adam the opportunity to sin. And God warned Adam that in the day he sinned, he would die. Right? And when Adam chose to sin, he did not die immediately. But the process of death was started. In the original Hebrew, it literally means this. It it, it says, in that day, in dying, you shall die. See, when Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, Sin and death came into the world. Sin and death came into the world. And sin and death governs the world. It has authority over the world. Adam brought the consequences of sin. And it always leads to death. The wages of sin is death. So when he sinned, in dying you shall die. So what happened? Death came in in the form of guilt. Death came in in the form of shame. Death came in in the form of feeling separated from God and feeling lonely. Death came in and fear entered into humanity. Anxiety entered in. Self-hatred. Sickness. Disease. A life of death. And ending with the termination of life. Through Adam's decision, sin and death entered the world. Sin and death ruled. It governed. It took authority over the world. But when a person receives Jesus, when they make Jesus the Lord of their life, the Spirit of Jesus enters their spirit and they are made alive unto God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 10, it says, If Christ is in you, is Christ in you this morning? Then this Scripture is for you. Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. And we're going to get into this. What does that mean that that your body is dead because of sin, but then he turns around and says, but because of the life of Jesus that dwells in you, He will make your dead body alive unto Christ because of the Spirit that dwells in you. God's in the process of sanctifying us, spirit, spirit, soul, and body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, it says, so also is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul, right? God breathes into His nostrils the breath of life and it says He became a living soul. And it says the last Adam, speaking of Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. A life-giving spirit. In John chapter 20, verse 21, it says, So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent Me, I also send you. So what's our mission? The same mission as Jesus. The same the way that, that, that God the Father sent Jesus into the world, He is sending us. And when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Man, does that... seems like there's somewhere else in the Bible that it almost says this exact same thing. Was it in Genesis when it says that God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul? It sounds very similar to what God did in Adam in creation. And we have been recreated in Christ Jesus. This took a lot 
time to put these slides together. So, so you should appreciate them. So, <laughs> through the new, new birth, God intervenes in the life of a person when they receive Jesus. And at that time, new breath, new life, the, the breath of God is breathed into your spirit. When we submit our lives to Jesus Christ, we are born into the family of God. Can you see now how He's adopting us? He's choosing us. He's adopting us. He's giving us His nature, His name. His... And when He adopts us, when He puts His Spirit within us, it says that with the rivers within us become as living waters. You have living waters within you. Because that's how you were created. You have the life of Christ in you. The Spirit of Christ is in you. And He has taken your spirit and made it alive unto God. Our spirit is alive unto God and we become one spirit with Him, the Bible says. We've been adopted as children of God. I'm going to end here today. And the reason why is because I gave a lot for you guys to meditate on. And sometimes I can go too long and you forget half of it and remember some of it. So we're going we're gonna to end today because we're laying foundations. We're laying foundations. That's, that's one of the reasons why I hope we get our media um, straightened out. Because if you miss a Sunday... You missed a Sunday. These aren't little one-offs. We're building. We're, 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 we're going somewhere in this. And, and we're laying these foundations and, and, and we're going somewhere and, and we're going to a place so that you can start walking in victory. So that you can be set free from sin and death. That you, would, that you understand that the answer to the problems that you face in life, to your own personal problems, your own personal um, sin, hang-ups, those things, the answer to that is in you. The spring of life that is in you. Life that purges out death. Light that destroys darkness. The power to live. We're laying this foundation. And you will have a greater grasp on who you are in Christ. And who you were created to be in this world. You'll be able to walk in the Spirit the life of Christ in such a way that His life will influence your emotions, will influence your well-being, will influence your ability to think, will influence your physical health, will influence your daily decision-making, and will influence your overall effectiveness in life. This is how God intended us to live. That through you, God can flow and He can influence others for His kingdom. That God just doesn't want to change you, but through you, He wants to change the world. And, I, and when I say the world, you, right away your mind goes to huge world ministries or travel evangelists or all these things. I'm telling you, if the church would just start in their own home. Start in their own home. The world would change. The world would change. In
In Romans chapter 8, verse 19, Paul pens this by the Holy Spirit. He says, For the anxious longing of creation. That creation itself is anxious for something to happen. Because, understand, he also writes that because of Adam's sin, the whole creation was affected by sin and death. Creation is longing to become what God intended it to become. He says, for the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. This is why teachings like this, I feel, are so important. Because the world is anxious and it's eagerly awaiting for God's children to manifest who they were created to be. And that's you. That's you. And my prayer for you as we go into the next week that you would spend time with your Father. That you would spend time with God. And ask Him, what do I look like? Who have you created me to be? Where in my life am I failing to believe who I am in Christ Jesus. Because it's not, it's not about giving you something to do. God doesn't give us something to do. He gives us something to believe. He gives us something to believe. And then when we have our believing correct, then we know what to do. Amen? I love you guys. You guys are awesome. And I am so excited. I don't, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but I listen to what's being said in our culture. There are so many people within the church and what people would say, they're not of the church. And they're talking about awakening. They're talking about a spiritual awakening that's happening in America. Listen, church, we, we, we need to be ready for whatever God would call us into in these next seasons. We, 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 cannot, we cannot go into this next season of human history and be apathetic like we've been since the 1950s. We, we need to be prepared. We need to be listening. We need to be alive. We need to have new boldness and courage as we go into, into this awesome season that we're heading into. And be intimate with God to know what is your part to play in all of this. What is your part to play? For too long, the church has just taught that it's all about dying and going to heaven. And then we get hell on earth. You were created for so much more. And I know this world has beat you up. I know that you've had loved ones that have hurt you. I know that you've had people that you respected that has talked down to you. I know that you have talked down to yourself that you look in the mirror and you don't even like the person that you see in the mirror. It's because you don't know who you are. Your Father loves you. He, lo he loves you with an unquenchable fire. You are precious to Him. The Bible says that if you were the only one, Jesus would have came for you. Jesus leaves the 99. Just to find you. 
And you've been listening to the devil. You've been listening to yourself. You've been listening to what other small-minded people have said. And I hope that the Spirit of God is... You're able to hear the Spirit of God in the heart of the Father saying, you are so much more. You are so much more. You are so much more. Understand that self-talk, that shame, the guilt, the condemnation, the self-talk that says you're no good, you're no good for nothing, I don't even know why I'm here, God could never use me, I could never bless anyone, that does not proceed from the throne of grace. It's a lie. And it's time that you start awakening to the lie. Start awakening to the lie and say, no more. No more am I going to believe this lie. Within me are springs, are rivers of living water that are flowing from my innermost being. That's who I was created to be. Will we believe Jesus? Or will we believe the enemy? Will our life be formed on the foundation of Jesus Christ? Or will it be on the shaking sand of this life lived separate from Him. Because we all have areas of our life that we live separate from Christ. Right? It's not, I'm not saying you should, but we do. There's areas of our life that we have not allowed Jesus to come into and speak truth, speak light, speak life, and the energy and the power to come out of that. And that's what He wants to do in each one of us. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Let's worship Him. And let's go out of this place in victory. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.